Welcome, everyone. Thanks very much for staying. My name is Steve Kenzie. I'm the executive director of the UN Global Compact Network here in the UK. And I'm joined by Sarah Mariage from WSP and Nick Sankarche from Novisto. And we're going to have a, a fairly concise and short conversation um, about WSP's sustainability reporting journey. To get us started, Sarah, you've been at WSP for 12 years. You will have seen a lot. How about you start out just telling us a little bit about your role in the company and maybe just a little bit about the company yeah. to get going. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, th and thanks, Steve, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I've been with WSP for just over 12 years, so you can imagine in 12 years we've seen um, a lot of changes in sustainability reporting. Um, I came into this very much myself from the communication side, um, you know, in those days when you know, commun communications people were producing a little sustainability report on the side. Um, and uh, just a gradual evolution into what we have today. Um, a few key milestones I could mention there are, um, so WSP is a very acquisitive company, a professional services, global professional services company, very acquisitive. Um, and two particular transactions meant that we sort of had a little bit of change in focus in our sustainability reporting. The first was really what the clients, were, what our clients were looking for a lot, which was storytelling, storytelling case studies, and they still that's still very important today in our reporting, saying you know what are what are we doing, um, and what's our impact, and then the second one I wanted to mention was when we brought GRI into the mix in around 2015, um, new to us, rolled up our sleeves and learned how to do GRI. And then after that global reporting initiative, not sure if I should <laughs> spell everything out. And then as the years went by, just added more things into that alphabet soup. Um, we've been reporting under TCFD, um, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures for a few years now. We started reporting under SASB, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board a few years ago, and that was at the express request of our in investors. So you know, listening to our stakeholders and what are they looking for in our reporting. But I think what the, the, the biggest change, I think what, what's interesting for the group here is really having gone from this sort of the sideline of producing the same sustainability report to what we are, have today, which is an actual, an actual function, uh, a sustainability and ESG function with its own governance, which just didn't exist before. It's even over the last 12 months, I would say that that has really evolved. Um, and I feel that you know, the, the relevance has really changed. And that, that's all alongside um, you know, sustainability strategy becoming mainstream within the company strategy. How many in your team? How many on reporting? Yeah, so um, as it's a really, I always think about that one, it's a good question. Of course, there's a couple of us, you know, two or three of us that, that are full-time on the program, very much on the reporting side, probably just a couple, but there's always a big team behind it. I mean, you have the, um, we have obviously the design team, um, translation team, we have to produce our port, report in two languages on the same day for um, uh, publication. And um, so it's probably, uh, two or three in that actual team. But on top of that, and that's what's been so interesting, I think in the last 12 months, is um, in this governance, we can call on advice from many different um, people in the organization, other corporate functions. So I'm sure um, this is familiar to some of you very much. Uh, from finance, we have a special advisor, we have a special advisor from internal controls as well, as well as from procurement, we have um, somebody, a lawyer, who we work with all of the time, as well as somebody from investor relations. And this has revolutionized the way that we look at our reporting, absolutely revolutionized, and really helped us to um, move, move beyond just producing the report to really being able to look very objectively at the uh, risks and opportunities that we may have. I want to just bring Nick in to say hello and how about tell us just yeah briefly about Novisto and your relationship with WSP. Yeah thank you and firstly very grateful to be here today joined by actually one of our earliest customers at Novisto. Um, we work with organizations and their sustainability teams to really enable them to spend less time 
on reporting and more time on putting sustainability into action. Um, and, and so what does that mean? There's a lot of time spent on the administrative side of reporting. So the collection of data, aligning all that data with the different uh, standards. You know, Sarah alluded to kind of the alphabet soup of different acronyms you have out there, whether it's the regulations, the ESG rating providers, the, the different frameworks. And it's almost like a, a tree where you have the roots are all these different sources that you're collecting data from, whether it's different stakeholders across the organization, different individuals in the supply chain. It's very fragmented. And then the branches are all of those sources that you're reporting out to. So Navisto is kind of the trunk that connects the two. And we really serve to um, allow WSP and other organizations like WSP to gather all that data, centralize it, and um, allow them to channel it into the various reporting outputs, whether it's the product, like the annual reports or, or anything else. Thanks, Nick. So I want to circle back to GRI, because that, that's a big commitment and a, and a, and a big step. Was that a, f a factor in that? Was the acquisitive nature of the company? You're in so many countries, you're having to absorb the cultures of companies that have been acquired. Was having that standard helpful in that? Was that a, a driver in it? Or was it responding to stakeholders that wanted to see GRI? It was directly following, a, a, I think, um, we acquired a company that was already already using it, and I think that they taught taught us, if you like, how how to use it. And um, it was very much for us. It was it's just very foundational using GRI at that stage, and um, very foundational, and um, really served a lot um, to the structure of the port, even even as it is today. It still has a lot of influence, um, and you know, obviously that was voluntary reporting. And now, but. But what a good good start for moving towards the more mandatory support, uh, reporting, already having uh, some kind of structure in place, um, and then you know the metrics in place. Mm -hmm. Data collection must be quite challenging when you acquire a company that may be using different platforms in countries that may have different reporting requirements. How are you bringing about the necessary convergence to get what you need so that you can deliver appropriate quality data and information to your board. Yeah, so obviously data quality, data integrity, extremely important. There's several several ways that I could answer that, but um, clearly this is a, the third year now that we are right at this time going through uh, the data collection through Novisto. Obviously that's been maturing and we, we've, we've kind of grown with with Novisto in that kind of that partnership, um, and it's it's all about having that one source of truth for the data. So that you, as I'm sure many of you know, there's so many questionnaires to answer through the years, so many places to put that data, and you you really need that data to be. <laughs> It's got to be absolutely correct every single time and triple backed up and approved and, and signed off. And that's something we spend a lot of time a lot of time and effort um, making sure we, we, we improve all of the time. So I know maybe some of the other things that we're doing to, to improve that data quality. Um, so we're building on what we have with Novisto. We're also, I don't know, one thing that part of our team is doing is writing standard operating procedures in order for um, certain corporate functions to collect the data in the correct way. Um, and we spend a lot of time building relationships and talking to our stakeholders about data integrity um, and talking to our, well, it's the corporate functions really, about the stakes behind putting in a public report a certain statement, fact, number, um, and, and the implications that that can have. I think I think in the previous session, I didn't we didn't catch it all, but um, talking about the risks there and greenwashing, well, we spend a lot of time talking about that and trying to reduce those risks. Is, is third party verification and assurance rising up the agenda for you? Is that something that you're doing already doing a lot of? Is it, are, are you staying no, that's asking a, for it? No, that's a really good question. And I think um, we're only at the moment at WSP it, absolutely on the agenda because we're not doing that much of it. So um, obviously for um, the new reporting frame, European reporting frameworks, we're going to need to do that. So, um, so we're obviously working on that. We only at the moment have a limited assurance on our GHG um, 
emissions. I was just thinking about the challenges of getting an Australian acquisition into the uh -huh. community, but I'm, it sounds like it's the gulf between the sustainability team and other functional areas mm -hmm. may be just as challenging. How do you get procurement on board? How do you get finance on board? Have you got systems in place to, to foster communication across these silos in the company? Or do you, do you feel that there are silos in the company that way? I feel that it has been a big challenge in previous years. Um, however, it's also one of the po really positive sides of the whole thing. It's been you know, really rewarding building the relationships that we, I think that we now have with the functions. Um, uh, you know, ha th there's always, these are people that you're going to go and ask. You're going to ask for a lot of data. You're going to ask for a lot of reviews. You're going to need it to be correct. You're going to need this and that. And they're already very, very busy. So, so what um, the team spends a lot of time trying to do is <laughs> trying not to not to be annoying to the to the corporate functions, but actually to be um, supporting them with their objectives. So, so it's um, very important to know well what are their objectives in the business, to know their K KPIs very well, um, and to and to add value to their function through being so on top of their data as well. Um, I'm not saying it, it just me. I have a, we have a full-time analyst who's, who's in the audience today, so we're trying to get really on top of that data. So we never go to the corporate function and hand them a blank page and expect them to write their section of the report. It's all in partnership, and it's, it's been, I think that's something that's been very rewarding. And you, you have to be a bit of an all-rounder, you know, you know that bit about ethics and health and safety, and I think being, being an all-rounder has been helpful, and we've really made ourselves do that. I, I saw in your sustainability report a reference to linking up executive targets to sustainability. Is is that something that flows through the company? So that I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear more about your team and how you manage you know such a a diverse company. But is sustainability owned then within the functional areas? Um, so people are. Their their objectives are linked into sustainability. They're collecting the data that you need. Is, is that also part of their how they're evaluated? I think it, it, the way we'd answer that is that it's more advanced in some functions than in others. That's that's for sure, and it depends. Um, again, very much on those relationships. But yes, um, in our last strategic plan, so we have triennial strategic plans, and in the beginning, in the last one, um, very clearly had sustainability ESG objectives spelt out. Uh, and these are also linked, these would be the objectives that these functions are reporting on to the board of directors as well. So I feel that it's become inherent and I do feel it's going in the right, the right direction. Let's just switch gears and think about the direction that we're all going. And it, they, they mentioned it in the last panel. Um, I'm sure top of mind for everyone is CSRD. Um, maybe just do you have concerns about CSRD and, and how are you preparing for, for what's to come there? Yeah, so, and I think, I think I'll say firstly, it's, it's actually really quite exciting moving from the voluntary to mandatory, um, absolutely massive shift that's going to need, I think one of the sessions this morning they were saying that's going to need a lot of resources and a lot of um, education. I don't think that, you know, we tried sort of in our team but to spend a lot of time on the sort of education side of it but it's going to really need that firstly but more on the practicalities um once the sort of more legal side that we'd looked at the scope of what we're going to have to do um done various things such as um in q3 q4 last year um we did a double materiality assessment um so that that very very big <laughs> undertaking um so that that that's under our belt now so we're moving we've moved on to um a massive gap analysis as you can imagine based on all of the metrics um we're looking at under the frameworks uh, including csrd and um and then other things we've got to keep an eye on the disclosure side of it we've set up a working group that meets from around the world because of course there are other countries as well in the business with it being being present in sort of 50 countries there are other frameworks um and yeah just working towards the the practicalities of getting a report out of the door with the, the correct tagging and, and everything, but not until 2026 for us. So 
you know, we're on the, we're on the preparation. Yeah. We're actually quite lucky. I know other people probably have already had to do it. One of the, as Global Compact participants will know, we have a, a reporting requirement. And one of the challenges that we're navigating is how to reconcile our requirement with, with CSRD and other platforms. Mm. So I'm, I'm thinking now of your, your tree analogy. Yeah. Um, what's, do you have like a trunk? Is CSRD going to be the trunk where you're kind of the central focus of, of reporting and then you'll modify the CSRD answers to comply with other uh, requirements? Yeah, so I think rather than thinking of a specific disclosure regime like CSRD as the trunk, the trunk is really all of the core ESG issues that we're seeing across all of these different disclosures. Um, now, naturally, because of the extensiveness of CSRD, it will capture a large volume of those metrics and disclosures. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you look at the network of disclosures that are out there, um, there are there's a ton of overlap, and what we see in practice is a lot of organizations are duplicating efforts as they go through those various reporting needs throughout the year. So there's some seasonality to it as well. Um, different parts of the year, these different requirements, like the UN Global Compact um, response, will arise. And being able to kind of revert back to and, and tap into that system of record data can really streamline and optimize things. And again, our mission is to help move those organizations up the sustainability value chain so they're not spending all their time just acquiring and, and aligning that data, but actually um, you know, putting things to work. Becoming more sustainable rather than talking about it. Yeah. Um, we've had some questions come in and notwithstanding the way the votes have gone, um, we haven't mentioned scope three, but I know that that's for most companies, one of their most challenging areas is gathering data on uh, suppliers' emissions. How are you? Have you, have you got a big regime around Scope Three? How are you? How are you dealing with that? Um, yeah, it's a really, really big part of the emissions for for sure. Um, one interesting thing I could mention is that so we we work very closely with procurement, obviously, on this. Um, as I was talking about earlier, and um, the procurement team, and then somebody somebody else from our wider team, um, they have written. Um, a sort of a supplier engagement plan. Um, the plan itself, I don't, I don't think is public, but some of the elements of it um, around, and one of the main things around that is we've, we've sort of done some webinars and we're asking our biggest suppliers, so these are big suppliers, asking our biggest suppliers to report to CDP um, in order to have some better data around that. So it's all about swapping out the estimated data for, for the real the real, the real, real data. Um, so that's been the main part of uh, what we're doing at, at the moment um, in terms of data. Uh, and I was just going to jump into it. In the last year, the velocity at which we've seen firms transition from using an estimate-driven approach to now gathering high-resolution primary data from suppliers is pretty incredible. Um, I remember being at a TCFD conference a year ago, and you know, timestamping that versus today, a lot has changed. And ultimately, that's what's required to happen. You know, if you don't have the right data, um, it's, it's the classic adage of, you know, you can't uh, manage what you can't measure. And so as complex as it is, we were having this chat before the, the panel actually about industries like agriculture, where it's so challenging to, you have all these endpoints and, you know, if you're engaging with farmers, but if you don't do that work, then it's really all for nothing. So, so you have to go all the way to high resolution data. Okay. We've just got a minute left. I'm thinking anything that you thought you were going to get asked <laughs> that you were prepared to say that you didn't get a chance to say or any advice. I, I like the way the last panel ended with, with a, a word of advice. Um, what would you like to share in the last minute? Yeah, um, a word of advice. So um, I, think, I think if I can just go back to the, the people, <laughs> the people producing this, it's more about, um, and I know not everyone has a, a big team producing the reports, but people and the skills to be um, to be taking the objectives forward for the company um, and secondly back to those uh, corporate relationships that take time to build I really think that's time time worth giving and um, just brings everybody on board very wise Nick anything for you yeah no I was gonna say as, as corny as it sounds we're we're all in this together I think what's interesting about this new era of sustainability is that um, it, it's quite recent in 
the grand scheme of things. And a lot of us are still in the process of learning and, and playing catch up. So there's a lot of wisdom in the room here. And I think, um, you know, it's great to have conversations. would love to kind of learn from, you know, all of you throughout the, the week as we connect. And uh, yeah, I think the learning mindset's really important in this space. Fabulous. Um, if you want to talk to Nick again, Novisto does have a booth out there. There's also a, a UN Global Compact booth. We'd be happy to chat with you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks, Nick. Thank you all for your attention. Um, and now, uh, yes, thank you.